Greetings, brains. Welcome back to Disenthrall. I will be Patrick Smith. This is a video that started by me just kind of jotting notes in my journal when I started thinking about the things that I had learned and the ways in which I struggle over the years and years of me talking to people in real life and on YouTube and in debates about liberty. And I was writing down the, the things that I did right and the things that um, I did wrong and the things that are helpful and the things that are unhelpful. And when I got into the list, I realized, you know, this might be useful to some other people. So I decided to throw it into a talking head video on YouTube. So here we are. Um, so I, I don't have like a script for this. I just have like my bullet point items might be kind of rambly. I hope it helps you enjoy. Okay. So my number one is to murder your ego repeatedly, always ego is rational poison. If you have an ego about things, you're going to necessarily be biased on things and it's going to interfere with your ability to primarily interfere with your ability to accept being wrong or to accept the possibility that you're wrong. And that will change how you approach every conversation that you involve, that you get involved in, especially when somebody's trying to change your mind or when you're debating things, even when you're really, I mean, you can be confident and you're right, but you have to kill the part of yourself that makes you want to shy away from having a conversation in which like, like with a really smart person that might know something you don't, or that thinks that you're wrong. The ego is what makes you uncomfortable or makes you maybe not pick up the, the phone to send a text message to the person to, to ask for that conversation or to, you know, or that makes you want to change the subject and your brain will come up with all sorts of convoluted, perfectly rational sounding reasons to, uh, avoid those conversations when your ego is at stake and when you're worried about being wrong and we'll get into insecurities later, but you have to kill that ego when you're dealing with this stuff. And that's something I struggle with constantly and still to this day. And I'm pretty sure that's everybody, right? Nobody likes being wrong. Nobody enjoys that feeling. I've really had to try and train myself to enjoy that feeling. And it's still a struggle and probably always will be. Um, so that was my number one. That was my number one beast to slay. Another thing that kind of goes along with that is when you first start out going down the road of learning um, about anything, really, but let's just stick to liberty. You tend to watch a lot of, let's say, YouTube content. You watch several hours of some very smart people talking about things, or you order some books and you read a couple books. Maybe they're big, thick, meaty books. Maybe they're philosophy books. And then you instantly have for the first time more knowledge than 99% of the people around you. And it's easy to, from that feel very wise on the topic. You're not watching a few hours of YouTube videos, reading a couple books is, is not enough to make you an authority on anything. It's enough to get you started. It's like you go from being a layman that has never um, attempted to forge a sword before to being the day one apprentice. That's what, that, that's where you're at in, in the line. You're not in a place where you should go tell other people anything at that point, definitely engage in conversation. If you think people are wrong, definitely engage, but just it's that ego part of it. I, I see a lot of people that have read a couple things and this was me when I started. So again, this is my list. This is the things I did wrong. When I started, um, looking into the founding fathers and their philosophy and, the way they thought about things, um, I, I thought I was really into the thick of it when in fact I had only scratched the barest of surfaces. And so that's something to watch out for. Be intellectually humble is kind of a, a another one that kind of goes along with ego. <sighs> Intellectual humility is recognizing that very likely no matter how hard you try, you will always have biases. You will always have emotional blockers and walls and resistances to certain conversations and certain ideas. And you are, um, uh, a, a meat sack <laughs> that can uh, always be wrong. You can always be wrong. And, uh, and it's good to remember that constantly, consistently be intellectually humble. Okay. So that was, that was a long number one. Maybe that should have been like three things, but whatever. Um, I don't think, 
I don't think 117 <laughs> lessons I learned <laughs> would have been a good YouTube title. But anyway, all right. Uh, number two is, and I've talked about this before on the channel, but it, I mean, it deserves repeating constantly. I don't know those three words. It is a sign of a rational, intelligent person that has, that has murdered their ego sufficiently to be able to admit ignorance. Learning to say those words, learning to be okay in a position of ignorance and admitting that is step one to learning is step one to becoming not ignorant. It's step one to knowing. First you, first, you need to learn that you don't know what you think you know, and then that makes room mentally for you to go and then find out the truth and to go seek and to have conversations and learn new things. And if, uh, if somebody's challenging one of your premises and it leads you, they're asking you a question that you've hit a wall internally and you're like, oh crap, I never thought about that before. I don't know the answer to that. I will have to think about that. Thank you for helping me in that way. Those, I don't know, man, when, when I hear somebody confidently and without ego say that they don't know something, my respect for that person just whew, goes, goes through the roof really quickly. The other side of that is like, if you're unable to, uh, to admit that you don't know and you don't want to appear as if you don't know, and this could be something, look, like it, it, it doesn't happen. It's easy to admit that you don't know something about particle physics, right? For most people, that's easy to admit because most of us have never studied particle physics. And so if somebody asks you a question about it, you can say, I don't know, man, I'm not a particle physicist, but here's what happens, right? Like if you're a subject matter expert in something, I don't know, let's say for me, it would be technology, right? If somebody asked me something about technology and they're like, and especially if they lead the question with these ego, uh, buffing things like, Oh, Patrick, you're a technology God, you know, everything. Uh, I have a question about fill in the blank, blah, blah, blah. And it's something I don't know. I think it's a very human thing to want to bullshit, <laughs> to want to make things up or, or to just speak off the cuff, so to speak, so that you sound like you're more knowledgeable than you are, rather than say you don't know, because your profession, the things that you have put in the work to become an expert on become part of your ego. And so when you hit uh, a weak spot in your ego, there's a tendency to kind of bullshit people, N not like maliciously, but. That's that ego. Come, I guess this whole list might just be ego, but, uh, don't bullshit people say when you don't know something, when I see, I can tell, I mean, there's a reason why in my, on my Twitter bio or whatever, I put, um, bullshit detector. I don't know why, but I can tell when people are bullshitting and when they try and talk out their ass, it's the opposite of the respect thing that happens when somebody admits they don't know respect goes up when people talk out of their ass respect goes down. I, I don't listen to them anymore. Why should I, I can't trust what they're saying because they'll talk like they know when they don't, that makes them a liability, right? So don't be that type of person. Um, and that's really easy to do when you're doing like a YouTube channel or you're interviewing somebody or you're on a debate stage and you're holding up your side of whatever debate it is and your, your ego, it's not only your ego, but it's like, you're worried about letting a bunch of people down, uh, that, um, are depending on you to defend their side in the debate sufficiently. Right? So just another thing to think about, admit when you don't know, say you need time to think when you need time to think. I mean, even if you have killed your ego and you're in a discussion or a debate, Oftentimes, if somebody hits you with the proof that your position is wrong, you will not have time to sufficiently think that through in the moment. I mean, especially if it's something that's like worldview changing, that takes time. That takes processing and sort of meditation. And so don't be afraid to say, Hey, thanks for bringing that up. That's a really good point. I need to think about that more to see if I agree with it or to see if that changes my position. I, you know, thank you. I'm going to need to go and, and think about that and maybe I'll get back to you or something like that. That's really good. That's a mature way of handling that situation. And I already said this, but I'm going to say it again. Do not make up answers confidently. That's that goes back to the bullshitting thing. Don't make shit up and then state it confidently. And I'm talking to myself because I've done this before early days, YouTube. Um, I'm off the cuff. I'm, 
I'm trying to come up with answers on the fly to things I haven't considered enough. And it's easy to state to state something with confidence. And, and people out there often don't necessarily have the capacity to really detect, to, to, to separate out the confidence with which people say things from what they're saying, right? Like you, you see like world leaders, they speak very confidently, a lot of times nonsense. Uh, or in a corporate job, you'll have the middle management. They're very good about speaking confidently while using all the corporate jargon and nonsense speak that's actually saying nothing. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Don't, don't do that. Um, let's see what else. Ignorance is an opportunity. When, when you find out you don't know something, if it's something important to you or that could affect your life, instead of viewing that as a weakness or a vulnerability to your ego, you should see that as a discovered opportunity that it's, it's your chance to learn something. It's your chance to learn truth that will hopefully improve your life. You should embrace that. You should love discovering when you have ignorance in an area. Okay. So that was number two, number three. The last word is overrated. <sighs> when we're arguing, especially in, in person, but also in debates on the internet or whatever, it's, it's very uh, easy to get swept up in the moment. And, and towards the end of the debate, when it's time to stop, when both, pe both sides have said their piece and maybe you're, both sides are repeating themselves and you're just not getting anywhere and it's time to stop, you sometimes you have to let the other person have the last word. And what I've discovered, and I didn't do this in the beginning uh, on purpose, but once I, once I've done it a few times, allowing the person you disagree with to have the last word shows extreme confidence in your position. If you can let that other wrong person say whatever they're going to say as the last word, so be it that that displays that you're not arguing from ego, that you're not arguing from emotion, that you are supremely confident in your position. Um, and it's also a very adult sort of mature way to end a conversation. It's like, okay, why don't, why don't you have the last word? I'll listen to what you have to say. Um, you've heard my position, but you know, go ahead. I'll give you the last word and then we'll, we'll go our separate ways or we'll end the, the debate or the video or whatever. That's really good. Really mature. We are surrounded by people that are wrong on everything constantly. You will never, no matter how much you work and flap your jaws, you will never fix them all. You will never correct them all and teach them all everything that you know and vice versa. There are things that you are ignorant on and you are wrong on. And, uh, that's kind of what we're talking about. But the point is just realize, look, it's, a. Uh, it, there's too many of them, man. You're never going to fix them all. You got to learn to give up and walk away happily, securely, easily. Um, so get comfortable walking away. That helps sometimes. It really does. I, the, the times when I calmly, maturely walk away from a conversation after having given the other person the last word that they have come back later and said, you know, you left me thinking, why did I leave them thinking? Because I, I was confident and calm and rational and walked away and gave them the last word rather than, you know, verbally beating them down or whatever. That'll leave them less likely to consider what I had to say. Number four, own your insecurities. Now, I guess this is kind of related to some of the stuff I've talked about earlier, but it's that, um, I don't know, maybe it's the inverse of ego. Um, it's, it's the, it's the anti-ego. It's the, it's the fear that you're wrong. Uh, it's the fear that if I'm challenged on something, can I show my work? It's your fear. Like if you're presenting something to somebody, you're worried, oh man, am I going to be capable of communicating this idea well enough to do the idea justice? Maybe I should just keep my mouth shut or, or send them a book or link them a YouTube video of somebody else that I think does it better because I'm just not confident in my ability to communicate. Um, that kind of like anti-ego is also something that you need to work on. Um, and I think you work on it by owning it. First of all, saying to yourself, wow, I'm feeling nervous or 
not competent enough to have the conversations about important topics to me. How can I work on that? How can I improve on that? Spoiler, it's actually by doing it more, <laughs> doing the things that you don't feel confident at more and getting practice. That's how you will gain confidence. But um, by owning those insecurities, you can then sort of, you can't fix a problem you don't know exists, right? So, uh, and it's easy when we're insecure to just let the emotional stuff bubble under the surface unrecognized. Well, it will bubble under the surface for the rest of your existence on this planet unless you call it out and say, hey, you insecurity, you exist and I'm going to fix you uh, and and make a plan to fix it. That kind of thing. That was um, that was a helpful tip for me. Another thing, uh, another kind of insecurity. This might just be me. <laughs> I don't know, but um. An insecurity I've always had is the echo chamber thing. And I've talked about this multiple times on the channel, so I won't go super long on it now, but I've always been worried that I'm in some kind of echo chamber and I ha and I don't have enough people around me that will push back on me if I'm wrong or um, that's, that's less and less true these days. Cause I really, I surround my people, myself with people that push back constantly, which I really like, but what it is is like, um, I'm drawing it out again. Uh, so let, let's just say that I, I've, I, let, let's say I've studied some topic very deeply and the, and the, the more deep you get into a topic, the less people in the world are your peers that are competent to push back against you. If you, if you state a poor position, because I mean, it's just the numbers, right? Like if, if you are in the 1% of people in terms of your knowledge on some science, particle physics, let's say, then necessarily 99% of the world is going to be sort of less qualified or not qualified at all, really to push back on you when you state something. And so in let's say philosophy or just liberty activism in general, the longer I've spent studying and learning and pushing myself in, in the direction to learn about this stuff, um, naturally by the numbers, again, this is not ego and it's, it's hard to talk about because I'm, I, I, I really try and keep my ego drowned in the bathtub, <laughs> but, um, you know, just by nature of the work I've put into it, I, I'm ahead of a certain percentage of the population. And so the, and the, and the farther I go, the less peers I have that are, it's not that they're dumb or not willing. It's just that they haven't done the work to be on, be at that level to, to provide pushback. And so the farther I go, the more insecure I get that I'm only holding my positions because I don't have enough people around me to give pushback. So that's another one of those insecurities that I'm constantly, I, I've called out a long time ago and I'm still working to defeat. And um, I guess another one that is common for people uh, is, especially in debates, am I engaging because I want to validate my current positions by winning the debate or am I engaging because I really want to be shown if I'm wrong. I really want my ideas challenged. Those are two very different ways of approaching a conversation. The first one will lead you to engage in ways in which you are far less likely to discover if you're actually wrong, obviously, and to the and that you'll walk away from with your positions validated. And the other, if you really want to be shown if you're wrong, you will be supremely curious to figure out the other person's position, the other person's critiques. So if they challenge you with something rather than just like saying, okay, well, you know, what do you mean? What's your argument? Okay. Well, here's my rebuttal. Thanks. Walk away. If you really are looking to know if you're wrong or not, you won't do that. You'll be like, okay, well, like tell me your argument. Okay. Is this what you mean by your argument and repeat it back to them? and then work through really understanding what their position is or what their counter argument is and even help them make their ar argument stronger. And, and it's sort of like you play their side against yourself. That's how you find out if you're wrong. That's how you actually validate your positions. I, I hope this is helping people. Okay. Number five, um, huh. don't output more than you input. That's like a general term in, in life when you are dealing with intellectual stuff, um, especially if it's debate, especially if it's conversations with people, you need your output to be less than your input. 
you need to be studying and consuming content 10 times more than you're communicating the subject to others. Just in general, just as an everyday practice for every one hour of video content I do, I really should be doing 10 hours of studying or reading or consuming of content. Don't debate people more than you listen to others debate. That's another good one. It's another kind of input output thing. Don't critique others work. This is a big one. <laughs> Don't critique other people's work more than you create your own. These are all, it's all mixed together. If you haven't created your own work, be very careful about critiquing other people's work because you will have no idea what they went through to create that work and what might have gone into the decisions involved in that work. And if you're just blind critiquing people without ever having created anything yourself in whatever field, I don't care what, I don't care what field or any or topic it is. If you haven't, I'm not saying don't critique. I mean, certainly I'm not saying you have to be an expert on, um, anything uh, on everything to critique anybody. It's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, be careful, be careful with your critiques. And again, like be ready to be wrong and be polite and respectful about it. Because if you haven't created something in that area and you start critiquing somebody, you're very likely to be wrong. And that could be anything like let's say music creation. Oh, I don't think you're the way you're playing that banjo is correct or good enough. <laughs> Have you ever played banjo? No. Well, what the hell do you know about it? That, anyway, I think you get the point. Moving on. Number six. This is a challenge for me. Um, but when you're, when you're just getting started for me, at least there's a tendency, uh, to try and learn everything in all the topics. And it kind of goes back to the topics that, what were they earlier? You know, philosophy, ethics, anarchy, epistemology, economics, libertarianism, um, the principles of all this stuff. When you start out, you know, nothing about anything. And it's all kind of interesting. And so there's this tendency to try and learn to master every subject. Don't, don't get, get, get your feet wet and all the subjects to find out what catches your interest and what you're really, really into. And then go deep on that. You are, you are like a tiny ship on a vast ocean. That is both a wide ocean and a deep ocean. There's a lot of topics out there to learn. And there's a lot to learn on all the topics. And you got to sail your little tiny rational ship to one of those points and you should go deep. You shouldn't try and, and attempt to go deep across the entire ocean up front. Is this analogy working? You will get lost. You will drown. It's just too much. You'll never get anywhere. If you try and do everything at once, start by picking the topic or the area or field of your most interest, and then just go as deep as you can consume as much content as you can get on it, find that path, follow that path, go as deep and as hard as you can. And then if after that you still have time and interest, then maybe pick up a second. And then if you still have time, get a job, but <laughs> then you can do a third or whatever. And then for everything else that you haven't studied, be ready to admit that you don't know and be ready to learn things that might affect the things that you do know. I think in terms of like activism and changing the world and just generally being effective in life, it's specialization. We're going to get a lot farther together towards Liberty. If we have an army of specialists collaborating with each other, than if we have a bunch of people trying to know everything, that's not really possible. That's, that was kind of the idea behind my not army, uh, conception that we talked about a couple, five years ago now before my daughter's situation. I was about to start the not army, which is, you know, a coalition of all the different types of activists uh, to try and bring all these specialists together around common goals. Might still do that in the future. Uh, if people still have interest. Number seven, don't be a cunt. <laughs> I don't know why, but, uh, libertarian types, uh, uh, struggle with this one quite often. And a lot of it is because. I think this is kind of profound, maybe, maybe not, but I think the reason why libertarian types have this, uh, reputation for 
being dicks uh, is because in the beginning, 35 years ago, 40 years ago, there were so few people thinking along those lines that the primary way that they conversed was remotely, not in person. And then over time, as things evolved, and now we have Twitter and social media, those conversations take place on the most toxic possible communication mediums that we have, that the human species has ever had. Facebook and Twitter, especially Twitter. This is it's the worst way to converse. But because most of us for the longest time didn't have in-person communication with people around these topics, that's where we were limited to. And that just really sets everybody up. It just poisons everything. Trying to communicate important ideas, complex ideas in 250 characters on Twitter is just the most toxic, retarded thing ever. And I blame Twitter for subjecting the human species to that. Anyway, even on Twitter, don't be a cunt. Be respectful. Be gentle. Be polite. Be calm. Be professional. And part of that is like, and this was something Kaysen taught me. So thank you for this, Kaysen. When you're in a debate, especially if it's getting heated, I have a tendency to, um, when I get really engaged uh, or really challenged, I have a tendency to start coming back fast. I, I, you know, I think quickly on my feet. Um, I, I am able to respond quickly. And so they're, they're trying to keep up and I'm hammering them back. And Kaysen taught me that sometimes you just slow down. You just slow your responses down and that reduces the tension and the energy in the conversation just by purposefully after they say something, <laughs> take a breath, think, think, then respond. Even though I may not have to, that will give you that moment, it gives you that breath. And this works with interacting with people on everything. It works. Uh, really well for children as well. Sometimes in the middle of a back and forth with a kid, just pause, take a breath, take a second breath, and then respond. It's magic. It helps. Number eight. Oh, uh, here's another one for libertarians. Um, when you see something as simple as the non-consensual nature of the government as part of the reality that is that so fundamentally changes everything in your life because the government touches everything in your life that it can be very difficult it can become over time especially the more aware of it you become it can become difficult over time to not make that the primary thing you always talk about with everybody all the time, everywhere. Don't do that. Have normal conversations with normal people a lot, often. Don't always look. This is like the, the last word thing and the giving people space thing. Sometimes if you're out having dinner with some people and somebody, um, I have, a, I have a problem with this and this is why it's on my list. All these things I have a problem with, uh, like you're out having dinner and, and some person that, you know, you just met that, that somebody else brought with them to the dinner might say something like, yeah, you know, it's, it's tax season and I have to pay my taxes and, and it's a lot, it's, it's a lot. And I'm not looking forward to it. You know, my, my response is to be like, nobody pays taxes. Taxes are extorted by, you know, by at government gunpoint. Uh, it's, it's immoral coercion. The government is a gang of thieves writ large. <laughs> you know, it's just, it sets me off, right? Uh, because you want to share this truth that everyone around you, it would change their, it would change their entire life too. If, if you could wake them up to it and there's a, there's a, there's a strong drive to, to just bring it up constantly because the government affects everything. There's an infinite number of opportunities in all of your conversations to bring up the problem of government because it comes up with everything. Resist it. Sometimes just let other people be wrong. Again, this goes, these are all tied together, right? You are surrounded by wrong people. You will not fix them all. You do not have to always counter argue. Don't always seek out a debate with people. It's, it's healthy and it will help your mental health to just resist that debate mode. Sometimes don't turn every conversation 
into a philosophy and liberty activism discussion. Just, 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 I'm talking to myself, right? <laughs> so th you might not struggle with this. I certainly do. Number nine. Uh, don't be a debate bro. Might be one of them. Don't. Ab so I wrote down something that sounds much more um, fancy, right? Don't abuse reason and philosophy. So once you start down the road of learning um, logic, the rules of logic, the types of fallacies, what inference is, how to form an argument, how to, how, what a syllogism is and how to create them. There, these are superpowers in the world. Like when you learn logic and syllogisms and forming our rational arguments and spotting fallacies, you will feel a lot like a superhero in a lot of conversations. You do not know the power that you're missing until you uh, take the time to study this stuff. People make nonsense arguments constantly all around you all day, every day. And you are not aware of most of them until you've studied this stuff. You're just not, you don't know what's going on and neither do the people making the bad arguments because they haven't, they don't know this stuff either. And so when you learn it, you like I said, you feel like a freaking superhero. You like, you feel like you're, you are mentally stronger than everyone around you <laughs> in, in a way, right? So to speak, being a little hyperbolic, but you get the picture because you can spot problems in the logic and reasoning of most people around you that they don't spot because they haven't taken the time to do this stuff. Don't let that power go to your head. Don't abuse people with that power. Best example are the people that constantly call out fallacies. Well, that's, that's a two Coke fallacy. That's a, that's an ad hominem fallacy. You know, like, you know, the people I'm talking about, don't be one of those people. You, you, continue your study, go as deep as you can on, on rules of logic, the reason evidence. This is, this is a superpower. It will help you in life greatly, but don't abuse people with it. Also don't use philosophy or the rules of logic, this, this slightly, you know, this advanced knowledge that you've learned to smoke screen in conversations. And what I mean by that is like, don't use this knowledge to avoid being challenged or to fog up the conversation. Does that make sense? It's like, if a person is trying to make a, make a point to me, that for some reason I am resistant to, again, this goes back to ego and everything else that we've been talking about. But one of the ways in which your brain with its superpower will try and emotionally defend against learning that you're wrong in a way will be to call out every little fallacy that it, it sees, even if they're not even actual fallacies, you know, and it'll, and you may use big, long, you'll start using longer words that only philosophy nerds will understand to sound like you're, you, <laughs> They're just wrong and you can't even explain why because they don't understand the big words you're using. Don't, so it's all kind of wrapped in together here. Don't abuse people with the knowledge that you've gained once you start getting into this stuff. And don't use it as a smoke screen to defend against yourself being challenged. That was a, another note for me. Number 10, don't neglect accountability. Uh, I need to be intellectually accountable. I need to create arguments and then submit them to people that are smarter than me. I need to hold myself accountable. And the best way to do that is to have people around you that can help you with that, that are outside of your brain. That's one way I mean to, to hold yourself accountable and not neglect accountability, going out of my way to have people help hold me to account in that way. Uh, and the other one is moral accountability. It, and this is like a, this, in this, this is a, if you are self-aware at all, when you're talking moral philosophy, uh, to people, especially if you're espousing ideas on what, on how people should behave and the decisions they should make, these are, this is serious business. And if you are espousing moral rules for people, you need to make sure that you're holding yourself to a higher standard, that you're holding yourself to those rules to the maximum. 
what's the saying? It's like those who teach are judged more harshly or something like that. I, I forgot what the saying is and keep friends around you again, that will hold you accountable to the things that you're saying. Um, otherwise you instantly become a grifter, a charlatan. And I won't go into the, the number of those that we have in the Liberty movement. There's a lot of them, a lot. Don't neglect moral accountability. If you, and this is not YouTube channel or not just in general in life. If you're going around talking about libertarian principle and, and non-aggression, uh, stick to it. Be, be the world that you want to see, be the people that you want to teach, be that, be what you want to teach. You get it. Whatever. Moving on. Number 11. Ah, uh, this is a good one. I think I'm going to do a, a whole show on this soon. We'll see. Don't forget about your mental health, especially lately. And this is going to, I'm probably going to ramble a lot talking through this. So bear with me. Philosophy can be stressful. Um, especially learning about the philosophy of liberty and learning the truth about the just authority of the government, for example, the gun in the room, the police that are, you know, enforcers of the local mafia's edicts. Um, once you, once you learn these easy, simple truths, the implications are totally life-changing. They affect everything and they can feel, uh, they, I mean, rightfully so like none of this is invalid, right? when you learn that the police are not the good guys uh, and that they're the tip of the spear of the, of the plantation owner um, and then existing in a world where you're surrounded by police patrolling and constantly looking to thump people over the head and extort them for money. If they break some nonsense law that you never uh, consented to it, it, the world becomes an adversarial place and that can be stressful. And figuring out moral philosophy and the implications of moral philosophy can be stressful. And uh, learning the truth about the world uh, can be very depressing. Uh, it can be very straining. Um, it can deeply affect every relationship you have, from personal to professional, business, everything. Uh, it, it affects all those, especially if the people are, I don't know, v v like voting for more controls on your life that you now know are immoral and it's not just democracy making making might right right um it, it can deeply affect and it can end relationship it can end relationships that can really get to you uh, it comes with baggage it comes with things that you have to process um you can't tell what unless they're your best friend and you just know them and talk to them constantly and know what they're like and what they're not like and can detect when they're off, you cannot tell what people are going through behind the scenes. Um, and people can't tell what you're going through behind the scenes often. It's just not how it works unless you're really, unless you know the person really closely. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is don't neglect your mental health. Which means if you find yourself being overstressed, being over, uh, over depressed, being overstrained, um, take a break, learn to say no. You don't always have to talk about it. You don't always have to be an activist and, and make YouTube videos. I take breaks from time to time on this channel because of my mental health, you know, like especially, especially back when I was trying to do the daily shows or the weekly shows on current events. I stopped doing those after less than a month because just being constantly mired in the tragedy that is a lot of the things happening in the world is just not mentally healthy for me. I don't know how other people do it. I don't, it's not me. So I don't do it. Mind your mental health, learn to say no, make changes to make yourself more happy, uh, make changes to make yourself more peace, more at peace and secure and mentally healthy. Uh, it, it, <sighs> It, it is a must. It is a must. If you don't, if you, if you do neglect your mental health, your mental health will deteriorate and eventually, uh, you won't be able to do the things you do want to do anymore. Okay. Number 12, last one. I talked about this uh, a few times on the channel, but this was, this was like my most important lesson to work on for myself. But I think it's the most important lesson for other people in, in the world. So I wanted to make this the last one that we go out on. Cause I think it's really, really fucking important to all the communication in your entire life. 
listen to what people are trying to communicate rather than their communication. This goes for every communication in your life. This is not just about liberty. It's not about anything. It could be your wife, your children, your friends, your boss, your coworkers, the, the pig that pulled you over for speeding. Like, I mean, everybody. <laughs> Language, this is, I've, I came up with a saying and I think it's perfect. Language is a lossy thought compression algorithm. The words that we use are all have subjective meanings. Every brain you encounter will have a slightly different meaning or intention or feeling attached to every single word that you use to communicate and them to you. You hold a subjective interpretation and feeling attached to every word inside your head. And when other people say the words, all of those attachments that you have in your head that they don't, and they don't even know about get involved between your ears. So recognize that that's how this works. Recognize that the language is like, um, a staticky radio transmission. That's not in, in entirely clear. Even when somebody is speaking perfectly intelligible English to you, realize that there's so, uh, so much baggage and so much subjectivity and language and feeling and thought and bias and emotion on both sides of the communication, that it's like a layer of static over the whole thing. And so even when you think somebody is being perfectly clear about what they're thinking and saying and trying to communicate, you might have it wrong. And this is about listen to what people are trying to communicate rather than their communication. That involves active listening. That involves going back and forth with them to clarify, making less assumptions about what they're trying to communicate and asking more questions. And, you know, one of the things you do when you're trying to send a file is the, the computer will also send a checksum with each patch with each packet. And without getting too nerdy, you can compare the data and the checksum and know if the data is valid with the checksum. Same kind of thing when you're having a conversation with people. If somebody says something to you and you can be like, oh, did you, did you mean this? Is this what you meant? Uh, that's the checksum. That's the verification of what they're trying to communicate, stating things back to people. And even when people say something that comes off obnoxious or they say it in a, in a way that hits you wrong, try and divest yourself from the emotions of it and, and look and try and get inside their head and figure out what they're trying to communicate, not what they're trying to say. A lot of, because sometimes the words will, will communicate something that they're not trying to communicate. It'll maybe even the opposite. Sometimes they'll say one thing when they're really trying to say another. And if you, and if you take your focus off the specific words that they're saying and put the focus on their brain, <laughs> And I, and I, I do this mentally sometimes when I'm talking to people about something important, I almost focus, uh, a little bit on, I wonder what's in between their, like in their brain matter right now that they're trying to communicate to me with these words. Let me make sure that I figure that out rather than focus on the specific language they used. Hopefully I've like talked around this enough to communicate clearly what I'm trying to say. Uh, so I'll stop beating it to death. But if you have questions or if I'm not being cl uh, clear enough, let me know. So that was, wow, this video turned out way longer than I thought it'd be. <laughs> so that's, that was 12 things I've learned uh, about communicating with people, about communicating liberty to people, about what to do and what not to do. Uh, I'm sure that's not everything. I'm sure that you guys watching this have some cool ideas of your own. And I want to learn from you. If you know, uh, if you have some tips that I don't know or things that you've learned, please put them in the comments. I will absolutely read them. Uh, let me know if this helped. I appreciate it.